More division and turmoil with the Clark County School Board and Superintendent Dr. Jesus Jara. Three trustees want to bring another vote to rescind his termination. This while Jara's attorney is sending a letter to board counsel alleging harassment by some members of the board. Our Tiffany Lane breaks it all down for us in News 3's Education Project. CCSD families say the focus has shifted from students and staff as they deal with the challenges of the pandemic and staffing shortages, with all eyes now on the Board of Trustees and Superintendent Jara as conflict continues. The most recent update, three trustees, including one who voted to terminate the top boss's contract, have sent a request to reconsider removing him from his post. Monday, a news conference by the president of the School Board of Trustees, one of the four people who voted to terminate Dr. Jesus Jara's employment with the district. I asked Linda Cavazos about whether she thinks a revote would pass. So as far as whether I think that that is going to pass or not, I cannot comment on how people will vote. The three trustees also request investigating potential harassment of Jara and his cabinet. As far as when these could come to the board for a possible vote. Looking more toward November 18th because we quite honestly, Tiffany, don't even have a day that's open for a special meeting. Something else Cavazos brought up tonight, a letter that was leaked accusing several board members of harassment and a hostile working environment towards Jara. This letter sent from attorneys for Jara to board counsel Marianne Miller. It was leaked. A couple of the things in there are absolutely incorrect. Cavazos denying several allegations made in that letter, a letter she clarified is not a lawsuit. It states that um, a closed session was called for the purpose of addressing hostile work environment and harassment. I can state to you right now unequivocally without being able to go into the details that that was a business meeting called by the superintendent they are very common to have before we have our actual board meeting that starts at five. And one more bombshell from the letter, here's Cavazos. What was a surprise is that within the part that had to do with harassment and bullying is that an additional $2 million is being asked by the superintendent as a payout. UNLV Game Changer. Before fans can watch the running Rebels at home, they'll have to show proof of vaccination. Today, the university unveiled how fans show their status, and it is different from other vaccine verification programs. It's the big story tonight. Our News 3's Lauren Clark here live to show us how. Well, Maria, it's something you can actually pull up right on your phone. You felt the information one time on a link they have, and that pass can be texted or emailed to you before each home game. Now, students are reacting to the move. Been very good. Wood, yes, from the outside, Moses Wood for three. Cheering on the UNLV running Rebels is something all students look forward to. I don't really know anything <laughs> about basketball. <laughs> well, maybe not all. But while freshman Derrica wasn't exactly planning on going to a game, she says she supports the new decision to show proof of vaccination before getting in. So I think it's much safer if everyone is vaccinated. The move isn't a new one. Earlier, Governor Sisolak gave events two choices, either mask up by requiring everyone to wear masks or vax up, having all attendees show proof of vaccination. Events like the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo starting December 2nd are choosing the former, while sporting events like the Raiders and now UNLV basketball games are choosing the latter. I think it's a good thing. Freshman Casey also pointing out students taking in-person classes must be vaccinated for the 2022 spring semester. Registration started last week with proof required. I think it's a good idea that we're finally enforcing this rule. Not everyone agrees. I think it's a little ridiculous. Sophomore Anna thinks it's a bridge too far. I think that's a little unfair and a little bit exclusive. I just feel like they're already pursuing that idea of the vaccine on everything and everyone, and I think it's a little too extreme. But for others, it's a needed step to keep everyone healthy. People have their own choices, but at the end of the day, we want to make, um, make it right that like uh, keep everyone safe and sorry. And UNLV's game kicks off tomorrow at 7 p.m. at Thomas and Mack Center. They'll face off Gardner-Webb. Facing hostile workplace complaints, there is now a change coming to the Nevada Board of Regents. 
The regents oversee Nevada's higher education system. Two of the regents who are the subject of a complaint are temporarily giving up their leadership roles. Our Jeff Gillen has been following this story since it broke last month and now has an update in the newsroom. I talked with a member of the Board of Regents about what she expects to happen Friday at that special meeting. It will be the first time Regents have met since news broke about the hostile workplace complaint last month. Friday is going to take care of Friday. We have it. Um, it just came out. The agenda just came out. So it's pretty much up in the air what will happen. That's the take from Regent Laura Perkins, one of Clark County's regents on the board. The only item of business at the special meeting this Friday is to elect a new chair and vice chair. The two people currently in those roles, Chair Kathy McAdoo and Vice Chair Patrick Carter, have decided to temporarily step down. They're the focus of claims by the person who runs the higher ed system, Chancellor Melody Rose, that they fostered a hostile work environment and were actively trying to get her ousted. The claims are the subject of an internal investigation. McAdoo and Carter say they will not comment until the investigation is finished. Perkins tells me she does not want the investigation rushed. I would hope that we don't try to narrow it to a specific time, but however much time it takes to get to the bottom and to make sure that all sides are heard and that the, um, the outcome is fair and that's, that's the most important thing, not, a, not necessarily a time frame. Thirteen people sit on the board. The Melody Rose complaint is not the only one before them. We told you first last week, the president of Truckee Meadows Community College has filed a hostile workplace complaint against unspecified regions. And that poses a problem to former state Senator Warren Hardy. Well, here's the problem with Friday. Uh, we don't know what this, we really don't know the details of this new complaint. So who's going to take over? Is it somebody that's got another complaint filed against them? What we do know about this latest complaint, according to an email sent to Regents, is that the complaint specifically states that the current chair and vice chair are not the subject. In the meantime, it's more turbulence for the board, which oversees eight institutions with a $1.2 billion budget. Critics had worried the complaint by Melody Rose against McAdoo and Carter could freeze the workings of the administration. Not so, claims Perkins. We have eight highly capable presidents that are doing the day-to-day -day and, and making sure that that mission happens. Um, is it a little awkward? Yes. But is it completely hampering um, the, the business of making policy? No. Hi everybody, I'm Reed Cowan from News 3 Las Vegas. We want to thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. Remember, you can always see more of our videos by clicking on the video links. And also don't forget to click that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on any of our YouTube updates. Thanks for watching.